Yeah. Well, um, I can introduce myself if you want. Um, so I'm uh, Christopher Vanacore, uh, as you know. Um, I am a suborbital advanced astronaut candidate for Project Possum. It is a very nice experience to be uh, joining during these ages, uh, the astronaut program, because it gives me a lot of advantage in uh, how to learn uh, about, you know, uh, missions, um, how to prepare for an astronaut program. Uh, they will also give me like, you know, the hypoxia lab so I can learn about how to deal with the, uh, with the loss of uh, oxygen in your uh, system. And uh, also uh, learn some instruments of uh, an airplane uh, during uh, zero gravity flight, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's, it's been a great experience. Um, I'm also doing a double major at Amber Riddle Aeronautical University. It's in Daytona Beach, Florida. And basically I'm pursuing a bachelor's of science in astronautical engineering and also in space flight operations. Now, why am I choosing two degrees? Well, uh, for a lot of people it would be a lot, uh, but the reason why I'm doing two degrees is basically because astronautical engineering would give me the foundations of obviously engineering, so building, uh, designing in CAD um, models of rockets uh, or robots uh, for next uh, lunar missions or Martian missions, but also uh, having the opportunity to be in the aerospace industry uh, because obviously in the aerospace industry we have different types of sectors. So it's great to have a backup plan. I'm also doing spaceflight operations, which would give me the foundation of viewing the aerospace industry in a different uh, perspective, uh, such as the uh, all the phases that is involved with a mission, such as uh, the, the mission costs of the budget, but also security uh, for during the mission, because obviously if a mission starts, there's the launch phase, and obviously there are some security uh, issues involved uh, during the launch phase. And many people think that a mission starts right when the launch starts, but it's not true because we have six phases. And during those phases, uh, many sectors of the, or many departments of an aerospace industry is working and collaborating together to get to the mission phase where the real one, which is the launch, and it's the best part, obviously, of a, of a launch uh, a mission. I am also a pilot. Um, I did my private pilot and I am um, doing now commercial. Uh, I also got my instrument add-on, which gave me the opportunity to learn the systems more of an airplane. So my first goal when I came here to Florida and enroll at Emory Riddle, I thought I'm going to be an airline pilot, but then I had this beautiful opportunity to get involved with Project Possum. And so this gave me the final goal for my career, which is to be an astronaut. Uh, so yeah, I'm following all my dreams and uh, I'm also, upon completion of my two degrees, I'm going to join the Air Force for a little bit uh, because obviously one of the requirements to be an astronaut is to be in the Air Force. So that's a brief story about me. Um, so we can, um, if you want, I can start talking about um, mission, uh, New Horizons mission. Yeah. Um, is it is the screen recording? Uh, I don't know if it's uh, me or... Here I'm recording it. If you like, you can record it too, I can... Uh, it says that the host is... Uh, a, I, can, I have I to give host uh, permission. Right yes. Just a second, please. Okay. Yeah, you can do it now. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, that was a brief uh, introduction of me, uh, but let's get actually to the main um, thing. So the New Horizons uh, mission, basically I'm going to talk a little bit of the um, outline. Uh, so we're going to have the history a little bit. I'm not going to go really in depth because we really don't want to waste our time on the history, but we want to talk about the mission objective because obviously it's um, 
the main scope of the mission. Uh, but then we want to talk about what is uh, New Horizons, uh, the launch milestones, the interplanetary trajectory, the space environment, and uh, data analysis breakdown. And finally, also the spacecraft systems, which um, it's really nice to know pretty much all the components that is involved with the uh, spacecraft. So uh, basically, um, some history. So it's been uh, going around uh, for a few years ago, uh, where we have uh, 1976, uh, we have uh, Dale uh, Kirkshank, uh, which discovers methane on ice on Pluto. And then in 1978, uh, Jim Christie and Bob Harrington discover uh, Charon, which is Pluto's gigantic moon. And in uh, 1980, uh, Pluto and Charon were found to be orbiting each other in a common center of gravity. And so a few years later, um, uh, Dave Jevitt and Jane Liu discovered the first Kuiper Belt object, which is QB1. And so uh, I'm going to also, uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, so as you can see, we have Charon uh, and we have Pluto and his little moons. Uh, so in uh, 1957, we have Alan Stern. Uh, he always had like a, a big desire for uh, space exploration and uh, he earned his master's degree and he wrote a thesis on Pluto. So that gave him the big inspiration of, hey, okay, let's do a mission towards Pluto. And um, so basically uh, in 1955, it, sorry, 1995, um, Mark Buey uh, used the Hubble telescope to capture the first map of Pluto's surface. And basically uh, uh, what happened was that Alan Stearns uh, developed his first plan to do obviously a mission towards Pluto in 1989 and obviously in 2001, the final uh, definite date is that NASA approves the New Horizons mission, creates, uh, signs the contracts and all that. And then 9 January 2006, we have the New Horizons launch. So let's go a little bit into the mission objectives. Uh, so basically, uh, New Horizons mission objectives are three. And the first one is basically to study the Pluto, uh, study the planet Pluto itself, uh, but also its moon, uh, especially uh, Chandra, and other objects in the Kuiper Belt. As I mentioned before, they uh, discovered uh, the new object in the Kuiper Belt, which is QB1. Um, so what is New Horizons? So basically, um, New Horizons uh, was uh, to be funded in a program of uh, NASA, which is called New Frontiers, and they funded at least $700 million uh, to uh, build the spacecraft. And, to, and it was its first one to explore Pluto that closely because basically it did a flyby. So um, also New Horizons flew past its major uh, secondary space target, which is uh, the MU-69, which is also known as the Ultima tool. And it's like a eight-shaped uh, um, asteroid. And it's basically two objects that collided within each other uh, a lot of years ago. And it, what happened is that it created like a one type of uh, asteroid. And it's the most distant object ever explored up close. Um, so once uh, the mission completed its primary objective, uh, Pluto's flyby then began mapping out new places, visiting the Kuiper Belt. And after taking a year to choose uh, their ne next uh, flyby object, uh, they chose obviously Ultima Tool. And as they got closer, they got, uh, looked closer for dangerous obstacles or uh, even rains around the asteroid. And that would decide if they needed to make corrections because obviously uh, one of the main systems of this spacecraft is obviously the Attitude and Navigation Control, also known as GNC. So the closest approach was in January 1st, 2019. And for four hours after its closest approach, the spacecraft briefly turned back to Earth to report its success. So it sent um, data back to Earth, uh, to the, um, um, the um, 
the center, the Mission Control Center, and obviously um, all of this was recorded in a 64 gigabit uh, recorder that was on board of the satellite. And uh, a few hours after that, it began then the roughly two year process of download, downlinking the uh, approximately seven gigabytes of data acquired during the flyby. So a little bit about um, MU69, uh, it has uh, basically, uh, so why it's called Ultima Tool, because obviously it's two names of two different asteroids that collided within each other. They formed an eight-shaped uh, asteroid and it's 21 miles, so approximately 33 kilometers wide. Um, so it's fantastic. And uh, let's talk about the launch milestones now. So basically this is the uh, launch milestones for uh, New Horizons mission. So basically, as we all know, uh, space enthusiasts, we have three different phases for the engine cutoff. So we have uh, Nico, uh, Seco, and Tico. So uh, we have main engine cutoff, secondary engine cutoff, and third engine cutoff. So basically, this is the launch milestones. Um, this is the continuing and uh, obviously, the Centaur second born, which happened, occurred um, 32 minutes after launch. That is the second engine cutoff. And we have the spacecraft separation after 47 minutes and 32 seconds. And that little piece there is basically New Horizons satellite. So let's talk about a little bit about interplanetary trajectory. So basically during the interplanetary uh, flight towards Pluto, the spacecraft is submerged in the sun's gravitational field. And for this reason, um, the spacecraft slows down as it moves away from the sun. So as you can see, we have this graph here and we have basically the heliocentric velocity in kilometers per seconds, which represents the Y axis. And we have the distance from the sun in light years on the X axis. And as you can see, this red graph, um, it goes down, uh, it decreases as it gets closer to, the, to Jupiter, but when it gets really close and it enters uh, Jupiter's uh, gravitational field, it accelerates. And this is basically why um, it's a very smart thing for aerospace industries to design a uh, spacecraft to direct and control it, navigate it to uh, near a uh, uh, near um, a planet, because obviously a planet has its gravitational field. And basically, they use this slingshot uh, maneuver. Basically, if you get close to this orbit, uh, to the orbit or the atmosphere. Um, of the uh, planet, it's going to slingshot this object and accelerate it. And so the close flyby of, of Jupiter was designed to inject a slingshot motion, as I said, to provide extra acceleration for the spacecraft. Now, the heliocentric speed of the spacecraft is presented by, uh, obviously, this graph. Um, so the highest heliocentric speed is the beginning of the graph uh, where uh, when the spacecraft got injected into this heliocentric trajectory. And when it gets to Jupiter, it slows down, then it speeds back up as it enters Jupiter's orbit. Now, uh, the Jupiter flyby was aimed slightly below Jupiter's equatorial plane, which is approximately 2.3 million kilometers from Jupiter's center. And basically, uh, the closest approach was uh, in February 28, 2007. And so you can see on this uh, image, we have uh, the green um, arrow where it aim points. Um, and it basically, it was absolutely really below the equatorial plane of Jupiter. And so the B plane is perpendicular to the north heading and coming the asymptote. Um, so yeah. Now, the Jupiter flyby geometry is represented by the figure uh, that I'm showing you now, and it's uh, from the equatorial plane. So the module flew near the Galilean satellites, uh, Jupiter, which are probably Jupiter's moons, that are 63 of them, uh, and it went at a speed of 21.2 kilometers per second. So it did not encounter any radiation as if far went enough from the planet, but I kind of want to talk about radiation too, because that is a big issue, obviously also for future 
uh, endeavors, um, even if it's with crude missions, because obviously we have big issues with that uh, now. So the New Horizons observed the solar wind ions that is encountered during its voyage. And the image represents some data collected from New Horizons. And it was like billion miles of its voyage to Pluto. And it represents the local space environment of the solar system. And this basically shows a simulated space environment out to Pluto a few months before New Horizons closest approach. And it performs the pattern in 2015, also including the path of the two Voyager spacecraft. So interesting mission because it right, as you can see in the image, we have Voyager 1 and Voyager's 2 path, and it almost coincided between uh, the both um, following missions. So the data provided from the New Horizons showed that the particles in the solar wind have picked up an energy boost which gains their acceleration. And these particles are also called as anomalous cosmic rays. Uh, so when these accelerated particles approach towards Earth, it could encounter safety radiation hazards to astronauts. As I said previously, these are, this is like one of the main issues that aerospace industries are struggling now and trying to create designs such as shields, radiation shields around the spacecraft or other systems to avoid uh, giving radiation poisoning to the astronauts. Obviously, this is a, not a crewed mission, but it also can impact uncrewed, uh, unmanned missions. So basically, this is a graph representing you the photon, uh, the proton energy and electron volts and the uh, rate per uh, second uh, power minus one. Uh, and this basically is the graph of different types of um, particles uh, called also as anomalous cosmic rays. So the sun's constant flow of its solar wind fills up the empty space of the universe with small particles and ionized gases, which is called pl basically plasma. So the solar wind is ejected from the sun, as you can see, but also the coronal mass ejections that which can influence the nature of space and can interact with the magnetic systems of the planets. Not only it can modify the magnetic systems, but it can also radiate, um, alter the radiation environment. So it was provided, uh, they stated that it's going to basically be powered until it gets to the uh, flyby of Jupiter in 2007, but instead um, Mission Horizons went three years constantly uh, providing data analysis breakdown uh, and sending back uh, information to Earth. So let's talk about this a little bit, this graph here. Uh, so the observations performed by New Horizons showed that uh, these highly energetic particles emitted from the cosmic rays and coronal mass ejections are a radiation hazard for astronauts. And for this reason, uh, many astronauts and uh, astrophysics researchers have been conducting over the past uh, few years and doing really deep space research, uh, including the location from where do they generate, where these uh, picks uh, generates. And as you can see in this graph, um, you can see we have all these little um, mass, coronal mass ejections and this, um, this increase of this uh, bell curve shaped um, graph. And here these uh, little sectors are intense radiation, uh, which could be really hazardous for crewed and unmanned missions. And let's talk about data analysis now. Um, so basically, 6.25 gigabytes of data was gathered by the spacecraft, which was around 80%, which turned into science. Now, these are some images that was collected by uh, the satellite. And as you can see, we have ice mountains that are 11,000 feet tall. Uh, that's one of the uh, objects that it encountered during its voyage, uh, taking pictures. I also took pictures of active glaciers of nitrogen and methane. As you can see on the right hand side, we have those two images representing the surface of Pluto. 
uh, he also um, took pictures of a nice uh, of a gigantic ice volcano and its nitrogen atmosphere. As you can see from the image on the left, you can see the ray of the sun shining on Pluto's surface, which is a beautiful picture. Uh, so, as we can say, coming back with the Ultima tool, or also known as MU69, uh, the two separate objects joined together by its gravitational forces, and it has a red icy surface material, likely discolored by the deep space uh, radiation. So as I can say, this radiation does not only affect uh, objects such as satellites or unmanned missions or crewed missions, but it can also affect celestial objects such as planets, because obviously all those radiations are falling towards Earth nowadays. Um, that's why we have the ozone layer, which we have like, uh, you know, uh, holes. And in these holes, we have these uh, waves from the sun uh, emitted by coronal mass ejections or explosions, which are nuclear, obviously. And these coronal mass ejections just bring a huge wave of radiation, which could be alpha type radiation, but also beta and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, obviously we're protected from this ozone layer, but you know, obviously it's a big danger, it's a hazard. Um, so finally, I wanna uh, talk about spacecraft systems. Um, this would be our last content for this uh, um, presentation. So I will be talking about propulsion, uh, GNC, which is guidance, na uh, navigation and control. Uh, I'm gonna talk about command and data handling, um, communications, uh, electrical power systems, and uh, thermal control systems. So basically, this is a breakdown of the uh, of all of the um, uh, let's say all of the components, electronic components, and systems that was on board of uh, New Horizons missions. As you can see, we have the UV spectrograph, uh, ALICE. Then we have RALPH, which is the visible color imager and IR spectral imager. So that was basically the uh, ultra high definition camera that was capturing all those beautiful, magnificent pictures. But then we have the radio experiment, REX antenna, which was basically providing uplinks and downlinks on behalf of uh, New Horizons mission but then we have the long range reconnaissance imager or also known as LORI. But this is, this is absolutely a, a very good, uh, another source of a camera because obviously the Ralph visible color imager, it's like it has its same properties. Um, but the long range reconnaissance imager is basically, uh, uh, still it's a high, ultra high definition camera, but this was ideal to capture images from very far distances. And then we have this bell-shaped type um, system, which is the energetic particle spectrometer. And then later on now, I'm gonna show you also what information provided each of the system, uh, because we have to obviously uh, know about it. And the, then we have the solar wind at Pluto, the swap, and that's why I was talking about space environment, because one of the other objectives that I didn't mention before uh, initially, another objective is basically to um, learn a little bit more about our um, universe, right? So know about radiation and the environment of the local universe, because we have to know what, how it could affect us. And then we have the Venetia Bernie student dust counter. Uh, obviously, a university brought uh, it up to attention to NASA that they wanted to experiment and pick up some data of the dust. Um, so they also have that. It's basically like a, like a, almost like an air condition filter, and uh, it just collected the dust nearby. So. Let's talk about the Ralph visible color imager. As you can see, uh, it almost looks like a Newtonian telescope because it, it has like a, 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 um, a mirror and it bounces the, the, um, the light emitted from the outside and it collects it, bounces it back to another mirror 
and bounce it back to a mirror and so on and so forth. And that is how it's collecting basically the, um, um, the uh, images. So let's see. Um, so then we have uh, something happened to my presentation. There we go. Okay. So then we have uh, the radio experiment the, um, antenna. As I said, it experiments the density, but also the temperature, the pressure, combines all of these three graphs and creates a fractional error. Uh, so let's talk about the solar wind at Pluto. Uh, so basically this is some images uh, collected, um, some database collected uh, on behalf of this uh, beautiful system. And as I showed you also those graphs um, of radiation collected. So let's see what we have left. Uh, yeah, so then we have Pepsi, which is the Pluto Energetic Particle Spectrometer. It subcategorizes in different classes, um, different types of protons, but also different types of gases. And as you can see, we have four, uh, three different types of uh, channels. We have the ion channel, then we have the solid state detector, and then the electronic channel. And it's all sub categorized in different parts. So basically this system has different inputs to pick up different type of data. Now then they also um, collected energy around and there's different types of energy as you can see in this graph. Now um, I want to talk a little bit more about spacecraft systems. So as we know, we have two different type of integrated electronic modules and each electronic integrated module has a, a command and data handling processor, the guidance and control navigation processor, but then an instrument interface card that provides connectivity to each instrument because obviously we can't just go by point A to point B without having something in the middle. In the middle, we have this um, you know, processing data card, which presides obviously the connection between point A to get to point B. And as I mentioned previously, the recorder, the recorder is a 64 gigabyte, sorry, gigabit of uh, RAM. Uh, so basically it had enough memory to pick up pictures, all those data that it was collected from those systems that I previously mentioned. So yeah, now let's talk about uh, reliability. Reliability, is, well, obviously if one instrument fails, how can we get another, the other instrument to work, right? So we have the significant cross-wrapping uh, design. And this cross-wrapping is continued with each command and data handling processor, which is being able to access to each of the redundant 1,553 buses. You heard me, 1,553. It's a lot of buses included in this, uh, in, in this uh, satellite. So there is a basically a brief, all, all those um, systems that I, they're all there. Uh, if you want to see them. And um, we also have the star tracking cameras. Uh, so basically there's these two cameras that are tracking uh, the constellations around itself. Now, as I talked about cross-wrapping systems, look at the graph. We have two different types of, um, of um, buses, right? So we have the system, the redundant system, which is not really common nowadays in the aerospace industry, because as you can see, if the instrument A fails, it, all those other uh, points, such as command data handling, the transmitter for the antenna and the antenna itself won't work. And so then you will have to have instrument B that should turn on and itself. But let's see cross wrapping. It's more reliable, as you can see. It's less redundant. It's a cross string, right? Basically, it, it creates these X's. So if the instrument A fails, it can't use the command and data handling system for uh, the A system. And so basically, it's going to use uh, for convention, the command and data handling for instrument B. And as final result, we get this. If 
instrument A fails uses, uh, sorry, if instrument B fails, it will use the command and data handling for system A, but it can go back to the transmitter B and so far, so forth, it works like that. This is the graph <laughs> of the system. As I said, we have a lot of systems that we already covered and this is basically the breakdown diagram of the system, which is very important. And I'm like a really big expert in this stuff uh, because I took a lot of um, uh, courses related to na navigation and satellite systems. And basically here we have the propulsion, the power system, command and data handling, and uh, the integrated electronic module. As I said, it includes with the, it works with the command and data handling, but also the communication system. Now you can see we have the 1,500 and passing of buses and all of these interact with all of these systems to make it work. Uh, so as you can see, we have the propulsion on the left. We have the hydrazine thrusters. Um, they are approximately 16 uh, thrusters that are connected uh, to the entire pipeline of the propulsion. and. Uh, then uh, all of these thrusters are set in different axes. And I'm going to show you uh, later now, after this slide, a representation of basically how we have guidance and navigation control of this specific spacecraft, because it does not go only on X, Y, Z axes, but it has subcategorized axes. So it's very convenient for this mission because all of these thrusters give uh, can provide different navigation. So then we have the star trackers, as we can, as I said, the two cameras which are connected uh, itself to the power unit, the PDU, but also to the buses and for convention, the command and data handling system. Then as I, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the power system because we have to introduce also the RTG. Um, so the command and data handling system, we have the processor um, and uh, many other uh, many other systems inside of the command and data handling system, such as providing uplink and downlink, and that is obviously connected to the RF communications because we have to provide data uh, to back to Earth uh, with that 64 uh, gigabit of recording. So. As I said, with propulsion, the thrusters, right? I did. I just said that specifically that uh, we do not have only three axes, but different axes, so it can navigate in different places. And it, as I said, it has 16 rocket engines assemblies, uh, which are organized into eight sets and placed all around the spacecraft. So they are usually fired to produce torques and control rotation about one or three of the three spacecraft. Guidance and navigation and control. So the GNC uses sensors to detect the attitude, the propulsion system thrusters and control processors to compute the required control actions. And this figure basically represents the various attitude control modes in the four nominal states classes, which is the TCM operation, the Earth acquisition, and the Sun acquisition. So we have the three axis spin, uh, the active spin, the passive spin, and um, basically, as I said, there's many axes that it can rotate on uh, this uh, satellite. Moving on, I want to talk about the passive spin hibernation, which is the PH, uh, the PSH which is on the bottom of the diagram. And this state precludes any onboard attitude to control, which can minimize the electrical power demand. But then we have also... Uh, can I say something? We have only one minute left, but we will start, restart again the Zoom uh, because okay. of the limit limitation. Yeah, sure. Um, yes. Um, okay. I'm sorry for I... disturbing your presentation. Yeah, you're good. Um, I just have a few more slides, so I don't know if we should redo the recording or, uh, I mean, redo this uh, Zoom meeting or what. Yeah, I will reopen the Zoom and then we okay. continue again. Okay, yeah, awesome. Okay, I'm going to end it then. Yeah, thank I'll you. see you again. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
or also called as RIO units, they provide the temperature and the voltage measurements of the system. The command and data handling system consists of hardware resources and the software to run through the command and data handling processors. Now, the communications consist of providing commands, uh, collecting housekeeping data, and low rate science data. They also distribute spacecraft time markers. Now, the command and data handling software provides mechanisms to control the writing and playback of data onto the recorder. Now the recorder, as I said previously, the 64 gigabit uses the concept of data types for differentiation. And uh, there are a total of 51 data types, including the raw high-speed science data or the compressed version of uh, science data, and also data from instrument that provide, uh, uh, that produce low speed. Um, so that's the, um, a part of the Rex antenna. Um, now, communication. With communication, as I mentioned previously, the command and data handling processors that are connected to the 1,535 buses, those are connected to the RF communications. Now, inside of the command and data handling processors, we found uh, the uplink and downlink package those are directly connected to the RF communication system. And they're essential, they, we have essential elements for the REX and radio navigation capability. As I said, REX is the radio uh, exp uh, experimentation antenna. Now the communication system is designed to communicate through DSN, uh, which is Deep Space Network, on a three axis spinning control modes. And I think I inserted uh, yes, there we go. I, so basically, we have uplink and downlink, right? So the uplink means obviously the satellites that are here on Earth, on ground, transmit uh, information to the satellite. Then it provides the downlink. It provides back all the information data processed in space, sends it back down. And obviously, this is the graph, as you can see, on the bottom part of the graph, we have um, these waves that go up and down. Now the up are obviously the uplink and the down, the, the waves that have like a U shape basically are directed downwards and they're downlink. So those are information received from the satellite. Um, now electrical power system. As I said, we can we will introduce the RTG. Now, the electrical power system provides power uh, to the subsystems. Um, obviously, we have the uh, main systems, which is propulsion, uh, thermal control, um, what else? Communications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, obviously, inside of that, we have uh, the subsystems. As we saw the main diagram, we have the branches of branches of instruments, but also supplies power to hardware redundancy, which I should have reworded that because it's technically not redundant system. We use cross ring systems, but also fault protection. As I showed you, if, so, if one instrument is faulty, it's going to use the correct instrument from another one, and then it's going to bounce back. And it's going to basically analyze which instrument is correct, which instrument is faulty, which instrument is good to use. Now then we have the some key components that we should know about this power system before we dive in. So we have the general purpose heat source radioisotope thermal electric generator. Then we have the SRU, which is a shunt regulator unit. Then we have the power dissipation unit, which looks almost like an exhaust pipe, uh, as we all know in a thermonuclear reactor, we have obviously these pipes, these huge pipes uh, that emit all vapors. So obviously also in the RTG system, the power system, we will have a sort of pipe, an ex uh, you know, to extinguish all the fumes. Then we have the propulsion diode box at the end. So as I said, this is the RTG system. As you can see, we have also the shunts at the uh, in the middle, so in between, it doesn't show it here, but in between the multifoil insulation, uh, 
And so basically that red part, we have the shunt units, the shunt regulators. Uh, then we have the cooling tubes to obviously cool down uh, the entire RTG. As we know, also in a thermonuclear reactor, we have those cooling pipes that go inside, they submerge it just to cool down the reactor. And as I said before, we also have the, uh, the power dissipation unit, which is the pressure relief device on the very far right side. Now, that's that, the power, uh, the RTG. And uh, TCS, thermal control system. So the thermal control system is on the bottom there of the diagram. And the thermal design calibrates the power and waste heat released by the RTG and the heat loss from the blankets and instrument openings. So basically all the dissipations from the RTG um, gets um, calibrates the power, basically the thermal design calibrates that power, but also uh, the heat loss from the blankets that is surrounded, that surrounds obviously the entire uh, satellite. The spacecraft subsystems are contained in the thermal bottle, thermos bottle core. And the average internal temperature varies from negative 40 Celsius to plus 20 Celsius. So we do not have any temperature issues, but uh, obviously uh, all of these insulations that we have around the satellite will protect its systems and subsystems. Now, the thermos bottle design approach allows the uh, module heat system to shift away from temperature control to control based on the total power system. Now, uh, I have like a final video. If you guys want to uh, watch it, um, it's really interesting. It just shows from some captures uh, that um, New Horizons um, took during its voyage. And as you can see, we have these red, this red surface, and it's provoked by the radiation that is in our local universe. As I previously mentioned, the, this red parts are provoked by that. So yeah, that's it, basically. That was great. Even it was a little bit difficult. <laughs> Used a lot of different words from space. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I know. Um, I tried to like be a little bit, um, you know, small with the arguments, but uh, I'm I'm um, studying spaceflight operations. So basically, this is one of like my main specialities. It's uh, basically orbital mechanics, but also satellite and spacecraft systems. So that's why I wanted to show, because you know we know how a satellite looks, but we want to also know what includes inside yeah. a satellite. So systems, subsystems, what it does each system. So that was kind of cool. And obviously, I showed you also some of the space environment. Um, content, but mainly also the orbital mechanics, because that was kind of uh, very interesting how NASA um, discovered that uh, that option to use uh, in order to slingshot and accelerate this uh, the the uh, the satellite 
using the slingshot motion, uh, using also the gravitational field of the uh, planet in order to less consume um, propulsion. So, you know, um, high, um, LOX and many other types of, uh, um, you know, fuel, basically. So, yeah. Okay, now we take questions from fans and also I have questions to you. I get it. Okay. First of all, I wonder that uh, for a new hor horizon uh, mission, why that Pluto is chosen? What was the reason for that? So basically, uh, they wanted, uh, as I said, um, we have um, the um, the person that actually wanted to learn about Pluto more because Pluto is obviously, you know, the farthest <coughs> planet or should I say nano planet of the solar system. And we had Voyager uh, mission one and mission two, which passed by um, Pluto, but they did not have a clear and concise imaging or data analysis of Pluto. So they couldn't gather enough data and so, uh, you know, NASA uh, wanted to know about more about, you know, all of this and kind of get to know more about the components. So the atmosphere, uh, learn more about uh, its uh, moons and uh, also know about the objects that are in the Kuiper Belt. So yeah, I that was one of the main objectives of this mission is to basically um, go to Pluto and learn more about the atmosphere because it's so far away. It's not like Mars where it can take us six months to get there and get data and, you know, and, you know, these are exoplanets because they're out of the Kuiper belt. For meteorous damage and out of this two, uh, what kind of um, damage there are for space crops and human in the space? With radiation? Radiation and meteors, we, we know that these are very dangerous for, like... Uh, yes. So, out meteors... Of, out of these two, uh, what kind of other danger we have in space, actually, I wonder? Well, let's consider first um, unmanned missions. Satellites itself, right? We have um, a lot of satellites orbiting Earth, right? And it's basically a... a very big, uh, it's a very big issue. Uh, also, I just received a message that says that we have 10 minutes left with the meeting. <laughs> yeah. so I'm gonna try and wrap up everything. Uh, we have, we call it space garbage. We have many different types of, of satellites orbiting Earth. And you know, this is basically a, a problem because you know, what happens if one of those satellites and we call these, uh, us as uh, space uh, flight operators, we call these space junk. Now, we have different types of orbits. We have from Molnaya orbits to Hoffman transfers to type 1 to type 3. And then we have the graveyard orbits. Now, the graveyard orbits are basically orbits where, uh, and they're also called as parking orbits. Basically, the, these satellites that are not working anymore, or they're called also as zombie satellites, they transfer uh, their last uh, propulsion or fuel, what they have left, they're going to use it with the thrusters to direct it, navigate it towards these uh, parking orbits. They stay there. But what happens when they fall out of orbit? So there's a um, uh, there's a an effect which is called the Kessler syndrome, and the Kessler syndrome is associated with obviously these problems, which we also call as domino effect. One space, one uh, satellite jumps out from the parking orbit and it collides with another satellite. Now, with the absence of gravity in space, what happens is that as soon as it bumps into that satellite, it clumps up into different crumbs of pieces of uh, the satellite, right? Now, those little small parts, they collide with other pieces and so on and so forth. And that's how we can create a big, huge issue with all these small parts just bumping into each other. Now that is problem, another problem with satellites. Now with crew mission, obviously 
Well, radiation, obviously, as I mentioned, but we can also have problems of uh, um, of uh, the near future missions if they go further, not just Mars, but other uh, planets later on, uh, they can encounter also uh, impacts uh, right from objects. Obviously mm -hmm. that could happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now they're also discussing about um, water resupply. Mm -hmm. That is a big problem. And uh, they're trying, um, I, was also, I was actually part of a project uh, with, the na uh, with the filtration unit, mm -hmm. the rack that is like on the International Space Station. And I'm trying to improve that system with another, with the, a group of, uh, of uh, students from the university, but also professors. Mm -hmm. Another problem that uh, crewed missions could have as problems during a mission is uh, fuel sloshing and fuel sloshing. I'm research. I'm doing a research now with that. Uh, with also with NASA, um, is basically a problem. Why? Because when as the as you launch uh, inside the spacecraft, the fuel tank, you have all this fuel that is sloshing, and by sloshing, it creates vibrations and um, frequencies. And this can cause impact of change of the uh, bank angle and so that could lead to a total failure uh, of the mission but also it could uh, decrease performance and by decreasing performance i mean less fuel consumption more fuel consumption right because more you move uh more the fuel moves in the tank the more it's going to consume fuel and as it goes up, it's not going to have that much distance left to burn to do the three burnouts. So that's going to be a problem too. So that's why I'm trying to do research on that because yeah. that is a, a problem later on for manned missions. Yeah, yeah. First time I hear about that, there is a bank angle in the rockets <laughs> as well. That is, Excuse me. I didn't know that. Yeah. It, yeah. For first time I heard that. In this yeah. time, I want to ask one question from another fan of us, Zin, asking you um, which gases are most needed for the atmosphere of the planet Mars? And is it possible, uh, if no, and if this is, this is carbon dioxide, is it possible to create or increase it in, in space or in the Mars atmosphere? Well, so basically, that is another issue. With Mars, we have lateral winds. These lateral winds can affect the descent and the final uh, arrival of a spacecraft. Uh, now with Mars Perseverance, uh, we, uh, that, with that mission, we um, made it a little bit more um, detail uh, the way that the retro boosters work because uh, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the previous mission, that was around six years ago, probably. I was uh, participating at the live event of uh, ESA, a European Space Agency, with Project Schiaparelli, uh, which is an Italian uh, satellite, and it was a total fail. And that was because they determined in which crater it's going to land. And they thought about, they thought it's going to land there, but it didn't. Why? Because we have lateral winds, different effects. The atmosphere of Mars is obviously different as if every different uh, other planet, but also the gravitational attraction, the field, the magnetic field of, the, of Mars. It changed the path of the arrival of, um, of Mars. And so it didn't, it didn't land where it should have been, and it landed crooked because obviously it wasn't determining the, orb, the correct banking of the retro boosters. So that's going to be a problem. Atmosphere, as you said, atmosphere is um, is a big thing to consider also for manned missions now because we want to have a safe landing for our astronauts. Yeah, that's great. And we have last three minutes. Thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for everything. Um, yeah, I space is immense. <laughs> <laughs> hours and hours of talking. Yeah, 40 plus 40, that's enough, we took your time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. 
But yes, um, I'm really thankful uh, for participating to this live event today. Um, I really appreciate it. If you guys have still questions, I'm still here for three minutes. <laughs> yeah, I have questions, but I think that time will not be enough for us. <laughs> oh. Well, if you want to have at least questions, I still have time. I can try and answer as fast as possible. Mm. Yeah, I wondered that, uh, as you know, that in the beginning, we, uh, when we discovered Pluto, we said it's a planet, okay. But then what happened, and then we said it's a dwarf planet. <laughs> so the story of uh, Pluto is uh, quite different. What happened to Pluto that uh, it changed yeah, the name so of it all the time? Basically, um, the sizing most uh, that is the biggest concern for Pluto uh, we it looks like a dwarf planet that's a dwarf planet because uh, it's not big in size plus we consider exoplanets as gas planets right that is one of the planets uh, Pluto the last one out of the solar system that doesn't has those characteristics of an exoplanet it's not gas okay yes you have gas because you have nitrogen and metal that are popping out as geysers all the time on the surface but that doesn't classify it as a planet because the size it's a very small it it looks like a like a meteor like a like a sorry like an asteroid and it has um it's just not uh, classified um as a planet mm. Yeah, I got it. You talk a lot about uh, space zombies, that satellites that like a dust, dust, they are turning around. And what do you think about Starlinks? Do you think that will be an extra extreme space zombie for human? Well, probably. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very cool that uh, SpaceX is launching these Starlinks because obviously we have, the only problem is all these Starlinks go up in space and we have to be afraid about all those all those satellites impacting each other because as I talked about uh, space garbage that is a very huge problem for us on Earth because all these satellites are orbiting us and if they if we use the Kessler if they have a Kessler syndrome they just bump into each other it creates uh, a domino effect it can shoot all those parts into orbit so it could be catastrophic for us yeah. Thanks a lot for I, We have less than one minute, so I'm very sorry, <laughs> yeah. but I would. I had really fun. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, and, hope uh, to meet again. <laughs> yes, hope to meet again. Uh, thank you very much.